Hi, my name is Desmond. Today I just want to share with beginners interested in wedding photography what I've learned over the last 15 years. Now initially you get a, a camera that takes really nice pictures and all your friends say to you, well we, we like your pictures of the mountains and the cat and the seagulls, would you photograph our wedding for us? Now what a lot of people don't realize is that there are a lot of variables to photography. I've Personally, my best achievement is getting published in National Geographic for a high-speed photograph of a water balloon bursting. I've written several books on photography, e-books on what I've learned over the years. One on general photography, one on f using flash, another one on blowing things up. I like taking pictures of explosions and blowing things up. What has that got to do with wedding photography? Absolutely nothing. There's a big difference even between photographing models where you have time to set them up, take the picture, retake it if it doesn't work, arrange another day if, if their shoot didn't work out or the lighting was wrong, compared to actually photographing a wedding on the day where you don't have a second chance unless you've got a lot of money to pay for another wedding. So in general, you're going to have people, professionals telling you, just don't do it. They're going to tell you, look, just convince the couple to sell a kidney or promise their firstborn or whatever just to get a professional wedding photographer and maybe videographer. So they're going to say to you, no, well, you shouldn't be doing it if, you, if you're not 100% sure of what you're doing. And that's partially true, except for the fact that a lot of people don't realize that besides the people who can afford a photographer, there's people living on less than a dollar a day and, and people that would rather just spend all the money on giving good food to their the people attending the wedding. They may not have the same priorities as photographers. And in another aspect, there are a lot of people photographing 50, sometimes 100 weddings a year. They, they photograph one, tw one or two a weekend. Some, some of them two weddings on a Saturday morning and one on the Sunday. And they know nothing about photography. So I don't feel too bad. There's people out there who decided, I'm gonna be a wedding photographer I go out and buy a nice camera that takes nice pictures and I'm going to set up my business and they're actually successful because they're good at business and that's part of being successful in wedding photography is being good at business. You could be the best photographer in the world. If you're not good at business, well, your, your business isn't going to succeed. So don't feel discouraged that you think you have to be a professional to photograph weddings. It's going to get to the point where someone's asked you to photograph their wedding and you ask on the forum what you should do and everyone says, don't do it. You're going to mess up their wedding and all the rest of it. And eventually they're going to turn around to you and say, look, we don't have any money. You don't photograph it. We're not going to have a wedding photographer. What do you do then? You may as well photograph it. So we get to the point of when you're going to photograph it, what is your main aim? You'll get Photographers will say to you, you've got to get the best camera and lens and you've got to blur the background and you've got to competition winning photos. That's going to please other photographers. Is it going to please the customer? Your other photographers will tell you to blur the background to bits and the customers might say, why, why can't I see the people in the background? I've, I've heard these comments from people. I've heard people say to me, our wedding photographer took all these photos for us. We, we look nice nice and clear, but we can't see anything that's going on in the background. My cell phone could take better pictures than that. And that's something you've got to think about. Do you want to listen to these professional photographers telling you how to please other photographers? Or do you want to record their day? The thing is, you can do both. You can record their day properly and make the customers happy and you can take pictures that impress other photographers. Just concentrate on the former, just concentrate on impressing your customers and the pictures that look really nice for other photographers, just show them those ones. Don't show them the ones that impress the customers because they'll probably tell you there's everything wrong with it. I was talking to one of our friends a while ago, they got this nice big canvas up on the wall of their wedding day. She's sitting in the car, waving out the window. He's smiling in the background. And she said to me, you know what? This is a picture that one of the people at the reception took. They just popped their compact camera out, snapped the shot, and it's the best wedding 
photo of the day. It's, it captures everything, our emotions and everything else. She said the professional photographer had us posing on the stairs and standing next to each other and he got us in all these poses and none of them meant anything to us. So unless you do that really well, just concentrate on capturing the day. I've looked at a couple of websites where people complain about their wedding and say the photographer totally messed up my wedding. Not one of them has ever complained that the backgrounds weren't blurry enough. Most of them have been complaining about the wrong angle, subjects not clear enough and things like that. But I've never heard anyone say oh, they didn't blur the background enough. That's a subject we get onto when we're talking about gear, what gear you should be using. And I know exactly how you feel because the 15 weddings that I've photographed have been over a period of about 15 years. When you're photographing a wedding every weekend, you just get on with it and you remember everything you did last weekend and how you're going to do it again and you're happy with your gear. You don't have time to sit and think about what you've got because you've already got what you want. When you're photographing your first wedding or just photograph one every year or so, you start getting nervous beforehand. You go on the websites and you look and see what, what gear is this photographer using and what should I get, what do I need to buy and there's this temptation to just go out and buy something to make the, the, the day better. Now it's a bit like when you go fishing and someone pulls in a fish and everyone runs over to them and says, what bait are you using? Uh, I'm using squid, uh, I'm using the same thing. What hooks are you using? Oh yeah, no, I'm using the same hooks. And what line are you using? And, and they carry on with you. Well, what swivel are you using? All right, well, that's what I'm doing wrong. I'm not using those swivels. I better, I better get one of those. In the meantime, the fish was just swimming from that side and he would have taken whatever he could get. But everyone's convinced now that because someone had success with what they were using, they must all have that same gear. It's the same with wedding photography. People go online and they see what professional photographers are using and they say, oh, if I'm going to photograph weddings and get good photos like that, I need to get that kind of gear. And it just doesn't work like that. And that gets me on to a similar topic of never try anything new at a wedding. It's like when you go hiking in the mountains. You don't get a pair of brand new leather boots and go for it. 20 kilometer hike in the mountains because you haven't worn them in you're going to get big blisters even if they're nice and shiny and new and expensive if you haven't used it before you're going to have trouble and it's I've seen discussions on forums too where someone says why don't you go out and rent the best camera out there and the best lens and all the best gear because it's a wedding and it's really important now what's going to happen if you don't know how to use that gear you're better off using the gear you know, getting the shots you want, than trying new gear on the day and it doesn't work. Even a memory card. You could decide, well, I'm going to buy a nice new memory card for the day. Plug it into your camera and find out it's not compatible. Find out you've got a 128 meg memory card and your camera can only go to 64 meg. Just whatever you're going to use, get it a fair amount of time before the wedding. Shoot with it a lot. Make sure that it's, it's going to do the job. You're better off using the kit lens on your camera than using a prime lens that you just rented or bought on the day and finding out that suddenly you're not used to such blurry backgrounds and you can't get everyone in focus or, or you might find that lens doesn't even autofocus with your camera and you'd rather, rather just shoot with your kit lens if you don't know what you're doing. Alright now, on the subject of gear, we're going to have a look at my blog, what I've recorded in the past. I had a look to compare prime lenses and camera bodies and zoom lenses and you've always got all these photographers saying well there's this basic evolution you, you start off with a kit lens that does a nice zoom and then as you advance you progress you, you buy a fast zoom lens to get if you've got a full frame camera 24 to 70 mil and, and a 70 to 200 f 2.8 lens um, if you've got a crop sensor camera, you get a 17 to 50 f 2.8. And then eventually you, you find out that prime lenses are just that much sharper when you view them under magnifying glass. 
and um, it's it's like basically you go to a doctor and you say to him when I move my arm like this it really hurts what does he say he says, don't move your arm like that then it's the same with looking at images taken with a prime lens compared to a zoom lens compared to a kit lens and saying if I zoom into 100% and squint my eyes and twist my head sideways and push my tongue against the roof of my mouth I can see the difference well don't do that then your customer's not going to zoom into 100% if it looks good with your kit lens then you're doing something right you don't have to go and spend thousands on getting prime lenses I'm not saying you shouldn't get them it's good to have them in your bag just in case you need them learn how to shoot with them make sure that you understand the difference in depth of field so if you take a photo of a few people you know you're getting the right aperture but you don't absolutely have to have prime lenses to get the ultimate quality it's all going to be good enough a fast zoom f2.8 zoom is going to be good enough and good light your kit lens at f.8 is going to look no different to a really expensive fast zoom lens at f8 as well you just won't see the difference so what I'm going to look at here is the scores on DxO mark they measure different lenses and how many megapixels you get out of each camera now I've chosen the Nikon D700 it's an older 12 megapixel full-frame camera the reason I've chosen that is because there's still a lot of professionals quite happily making a living with their Nikon D700 and a lot of them have tried different cameras and they see no need to to upgrade because this does the job perfectly for them now if we look at a 50 millimeter 1.8 G which is classed as a pretty sharp prime lens on a D700 it gives us an actual sharpness of 9 megapixels there's people making a living out of essentially 9 megapixel photos so then you come along and say well I've got a Nikon D7200 and I really like shooting with a 18 to 140 millimeter lens well there's an 18 to 140 millimeter lens there's a Nikon D7100 the same 24 megapixel sensor and what does it give you? 11 megapixels of actual sharpness so there you've got with a D7200 or 7100 and an 18 to 140 kit lens you've got 11 megapixels of sharpness compared to our 50mm 1.8G on a D700 which gives you 9 megapixels of sharpness so why can't you shoot a wedding with 18 to 140mm lens on a Nikon D7200 now I did that a while ago on all my other weddings I was charging people $1500 or so to photograph a wedding which is a really reasonable rate especially in New Zealand money and um, I had some friends who who needed a wedding shot and they had a large group of people they knew in the country and I said look I'll, I'll do it for half price and on that day I used my 18 to 140mm lens whereas previously I'd always said well I've, I've got to go to fast fast zooms or primes or whatever to get the ultimate image quality and sharpness and I felt this pressure every time I shot a wedding to go for better lenses I thought well I'm charging them a half price I can use my 18 to 140 millimeter lens and you know what it was the best wedding I've photo photographed um, I was happy with the results um, I put it up on my blog so this picture here that I took I used flash on this image and it's, it's I like it it's a pretty good picture and um, it just shows you that lighting and a little bit of knowledge is more important and the best camera and prime lens. Uh, we go a little bit further down. Here I added some haze to the picture. You get the spray called Atmosphere Aerosol. Spray it in with a nice backly lit subject and it, it really adds to the picture. So there's ways you can add to the picture without interfering with it. You, at a wedding you want to record the day. You don't want to change it to something that they hadn't planned. So there's various ways of doing this and one of them is, is adding things like this when they have a bit of time to pose, when you're going to do the formals, maybe when the bride has just finished getting ready and she's got 10 minutes, 20 minutes before she's got to go down and they're all standing around with nothing to do. Well, you may as well 
make a few changes. But all of these pictures I took with either the 18 to 140 millimeter lens or the 70 to 300 G lens. And I was totally happy with the photos. The couple were happy with them. And here's something that you can't do with a prime lens, obviously. You can't zoom. We've got the groom signing the papers and zoom in two seconds later, a close-up shot. Now you can't do that with a prime. And here's something that's really, really obvious. You don't see the photos that people missed when they use a prime lens. Because that's something that I've heard quite often on the forums, on wedding photography discussions. People saying, I went to prime lenses and after a while I was missing so many photos having to change lenses, I went back to a zoom. No one saw the difference in their pictures. We had a discussion on, on Nikon Cafe. Someone really loved his 58mm 1.4 lens. He posted all these pictures taken with it. He was always raving about it. And a little bit later, he took up, took a few pictures and put them up. And you could see he had zoomed in them. And someone said to them, well, where's your 58 1.4 lens? And he said, well, I sent it in for a service a while ago. And I used the zoom lens. And I couldn't see a difference in the photos. So I went back to using a zoom lens. So there's a psychological thing is that someone shows you a picture and they say this was taken with a full frame body and a prime lens and everyone automatically loves the, the photo. But if you tell them a picture was taken with a zoom lens, they'll straight away find a reason to say why it's no good. Um, these pictures I'm going through now are taken with a 70 to 300 millimeter lens. That's the great thing about having that zoom range, 18 to 140, then 70 to 300. You've got a essentially up to 450 mil range on your crop sensor and you can get a wider variety of pictures and if you were having a wedding photographed what would you want would you want ultimate sharpness sharpness when viewed under magnifying glass or would you want a greater variety of photos and if anyone can show me the problem with these photos well i'm happy to change my mind There's a few more taken where I used flash in the photos. I bounced the flash off the wall. So it's, it's the same thing with prime lenses. Uh, it's using flash is that if you want to use a flash, get one. Well, you should know how to use it. There's going to be times when it's going to help. In this picture, I was bouncing the flash off the wall to the right because their faces were in a lot of shadow. Um, this was bounced off the roof of the ceiling. And because it's coming downwards, it shows the texture more. So. It's one of those things that just because you have the tools doesn't mean you have to use them. So you might have beautiful window light. Well, use the window light if it really looks good. If there's a situation where you could use a flash, use it. It can improve the pictures. This one was also used. I used flash and bounced it off the wall. And this one too. So there's times when you just got to realize that you've got to know when to switch a flash off. But you also got to know when to switch it on. And don't listen to people that tell you, don't use flash, it'll ruin your photos. Because they obviously don't know what they're talking about. So you don't want to take advice from them when photographing a wedding. A little bit after this wedding, I photographed another one with the D70-200 and the 16-80mm to millimeter lens. And realistically the main difference is that I missed the extra range of the 18-140. to even though the 16 to 80 is a supposedly sharper lens and it goes wider, lets in more light. Um, this particular wedding, I'm just showing you these pictures to compare with and without flash. Uh, without flash, it didn't look too good to me. I bounced flash off the roof of this pagoda and I preferred that look. But then again, it's up to you which you prefer. But also, the fact remains that if you have a flash and know how to use it, you have both options. This is the difference between wide angle and a few seconds later zoomed in. And you just have that extra versatility you don't have with the prime lens. You could have a prime lens on, two, on each of the two different camera bodies. But then you've got to keep switching them over and you still can't get the same amount of zoom, obviously. You're limited to those two. Um, I'll just show you a picture taken 
later in the night. Um, this was ISO 14400 taken with a 80, 70 to 300 millimeter lens and to me that's good enough for what they're going to do. They're not going to make a full full wall size print of this. They're going to flip through it, they're going to send it to their friends and I had that zoom range and the picture was good enough. You can't keep going and say well I don't want good enough, I want the absolute best because then you may as well use a medium format camera for thirty or forty thousand dollars. But the full frame shooters will tell you now, well look the full frame gives us good enough image quality. We don't need medium format. And I can say the same about a crop sensor and modern technology it's just always getting better. Here's another example of the versatility of a zoom lens. Now I was initially going for this shot which admittedly is a bit of a copy of one of Joe McNally's shots and I wanted to do it with water in the background and in the sea. So I had my Nikon D40 which is 6 megapixels and my 18 to 200 millimeter zoom lens because I didn't really care if either of them fell into the sea. I wasn't going to take my new camera into the sea. This is the shot I was going for and then I just zoomed back because I wanted to show people what the scene looked like and I turned out to be more happy with this photo than the one I was going for but it just shows what you get out of the versatility of a zoom lens. Um, if you zoom in to 100% and twist your head to the side and squint and everything like that it's not going to be as sharp as a prime lens but no one's ever questioned what camera this was taken with and what lens I used. Should you shoot in RAW or JPEG? Well every one of the photos on my website were taken as JPEGs. Um, it's one of those things as personal preference but the fact is you can turn a RAW into a JPEG but you can't turn a JPEG into a RAW. A RAW is like a thicker slice of bread. You can put it in the toaster for longer without it distorting. JPEG they're getting better but at the end of the day if you really needed to adjust your exposure or perhaps change white balance and all on a group batch of photos um, it's really handy having RAW. And get a camera with two card slots well why not have RAW on one and JPEG on the other. And that's another thing talking about two card slots is have backup of everything. You should have at least two cameras and at least two lenses when you're photographing a wedding. Um, I like to have three available just in case. You can have your prime lenses, your zoom lenses, even if you've got a cheap zoom lens in the bag just in case you fall and break one of your really good lenses it's better to have that than nothing on the day. Um, when I say two of everything a camera with two card slots is really good. Um, two sets of clothing. Um, I once squatted down to pick up my camera gear outside and um, my pants kind of ripped open and another thing to remember is don't wear red undies with uh, black pants. But anyway if you've got two of everything you can always go back and use, get out your spare and carry on shooting the wedding. But it's really bad if you, if you don't have it available. This photo here was taken with my kit lens, Nikon 18 to 105 millimeter lens. A lot of people have said it's the sharpest photo of mine they've ever seen. Um, that's just going to show you don't have to have prime lenses. It's the lighting that makes the image. Harnesses. This is a really useful thing to have on a wedding day. Um, camera straps around your neck are going to give you a headache over the day. Get yourself a harness like that and what I did is I got these little clips that you could put on your belt and you could also clip the camera into the belt so that when you're not using it it hooks in there and if you need to wash your hands or something like that um, you don't have the camera swinging around on the end of the straps. They're nice and secure and when you're not using them having them sitting on your belt really takes the weight off your shoulders. Now I'll just mention editing photos. Um, if you've ever got a new sound system and it's got a graphic equalizer or bass and treble buttons 
and you turn the bass all the way and it gets really really deep bass and you think wow that sounds good and then you turn the treble up and it's nice and clear so you turn it all the way around and think wow that's really sharp and clear and you listen to your music like that for a while and it sounds good for 10 seconds then it gets really irritating and you wind it back again just to be a little bit more pleasant on the ear. It's the same with editing. You don't have to overcook all your images. Just make them look normal. Maybe one or two you can make them look weird or sepia or black and white or whatever. But you're not trying to impress other photographers. You want people to look at your pictures and say, that's a nice picture, not why has it got that strange color to it. Something to remember also when you're doing the group photos. Get the full group photo of, every, photo of everyone first before everyone disappears right after the, after the ceremony because you're not going to be able to find them all again. Then break it down into smaller groups. Right Before the wedding, you need to meet with the customers. Discuss what they want. Find out where they're having the photos, what, what the venue is, and what time it's going to be. Then go out there at that time and see what the light's going to be. A good chance it's going to be different on the day, but it's well worth going there, having a look. Where will you want the group photos to be? Where will you take them for the formal photos? Is there a place nearby you should drive to rather than the venue? Some venues are really boring. And plan ahead. You're going to be all nervous, but on the day, get yourself a second shooter. That's another part of backing up. Now, what I've done in the past, you go on Facebook and you start a group for second shooters, videographers, wedding photographers, and people can all meet up there and they can contact someone who wants to photograph their first wedding perhaps or someone they're prepared to pay to do it professionally. But there's always someone happy to do it for free just to get a chance at photographing weddings. And this group I eventually passed on to a company named Shootzoo. You can get their app where you can actually have this app on your phone where you can make contact with second shooters. So it's the same with gear, having backup gear and cameras and lenses and memory cards. Have backup photographers. They'll get different angles and there's a chance that if something goes wrong with your gear on the day, they'll be able to give you the photos. How many photos do you hand over? In the early days of digital, people said, well, you know, it shouldn't be more than 300, maybe 500 maximum, because um, they're not going to have time to look at 3,000 photos. Well, how much time have they got once they're married? 40, 50 years? Hand them all over. Um, just get rid of the bad ones. Um, maybe don't show other photographers everything you've handed over because they'll say, well, why did you hand that over? It's, it's imperfect and you might find that the customers will be, you're more than likely to find that the customers will be really happy with what you've handed over. One last tip before I finish off. When you're taking photos, first find the light, then find the background. There's no point finding a really nice background and saying, oh, come and stand over here and they've got the sun shining in their eyes or really bad lighting and it doesn't look good. Go somewhere where the lighting is good and then from there have a look which direction has got the best background and your pictures will look a lot better.